If you've been through training related to the post-converter oxygen sensor, you know that readings from this sensor should flatline toward the lean end of the scale, typically at or below 300 millivolts. While this is true, you may not have been told that it is normal for this sensor to occasionally swing above the 650 mark, hold for a while, and then settle again below 300 millivolts. These voltage swings detected by the second heated oxygen sensor are the result of oxygen changes brought on by the cerium loaded in the converter. It's important to understand that these slow and infrequent voltage changes are normal and do not indicate a deteriorating converter. If readings from the second heated oxygen sensor begin to look like the frequent swings of the first heated oxygen sensor, then you can feel confident the catalyst is not doing its job. Recently, a situation came up in the field that you might be interested in hearing about. Here's the scenario. A vehicle exhibits a drivability problem caused by a serious rich condition. The problem could be caused by an injector that's stuck open, a torn fuel pressure regulator diaphragm, or any of the other rich conditions listed in the know-how reference manual. I'll say the problem is caused by a stuck open injector. The injector is replaced, the car runs correctly, and is released to the customer. Shortly thereafter, the car returns to the dealership with a flashing malfunction indicator lamp and either diagnostic trouble code PO420 or PO430, a catalyst problem. If the catalyst was damaged during the initial problem, why was the code not set at that time? During a serious misfire event, many trouble codes are suspended due to unreliable engine information. One of these suspended diagnostics is the catalyst monitor function. With suspended diagnostic functions, the system can't evaluate the converter until the misfire is repaired. Once the repair is complete, the self-diagnostic function may have to run as many as 20 tests before actually failing the converter, and this takes time. Let me show you a way of speeding up the converter diagnostic process. Disconnect the negative battery cable for five minutes. This will force the PCM into a quick learn mode, which runs multiple tests within a single drive cycle. When the battery is reconnected, use the Tech 2 to verify that all IM flags are set to no. The IM flags are located under system information. With the wheels blocked and the vehicle in neutral, run the engine up to 2500 RPM and hold it there for three minutes. When three minutes are up, bring it back to idle, but don't shut it off. Grab either a service manual or this edition of the know-how reference manual and find the conditions required to set the converter failure trouble code. This would be section three of the reference manual listed under trouble code PO420 or PO430. Take the car out for a road test and stay within the driving conditions listed. While driving, use the Tech 2 to monitor the catalyst monitor flag. It should start out as no, and after about two minutes of driving, switch to yes. When it switches to yes, the system is done testing the converter. If the diagnostic run failed, the malfunction indicator lamp will illuminate and DTC PO420 or PO430 will set. The resetting of either code indicates which converter requires replacement. If no MIL illuminates after the flag switches to yes, then the vehicle is ready to return to the customer. I'd like to review a test that many of you should be familiar with. It's a test that can help diagnose drivability problems that frequently are not accompanied by a hard code. It's a test that every drivability technician should know, and it's called the fuel pressure test. One procedure that's repeated throughout the fuel pressure testing process is the task of relieving the system of fuel pressure. Here's how it's done. During the fuel pressure relief procedure, take positive steps to ensure that the car will not be accidentally started. Disconnecting the negative battery cable is the best safeguard. Next, loosen the fuel filler cap to relieve any fuel vapor pressure built up in the tank. 
Move to the underhood area and connect the fuel pressure gauge to the fuel rail. On this 3100 engine, the fuel pressure access port is between the alternator and the power steering pump. While connecting the gauge, it's a good idea to wrap a shop towel around the pressure fitting to control fuel spillage. Once the pressure gauge is connected, direct the pressure gauge bleed hose into an appropriate container and open the bleeder valve. Once the pressure is bled off, the system is safe for servicing. Now let's review the fuel pressure test procedures. Remember that this entire test is also detailed in your reference manual. If you haven't already done so, reconnect the negative battery cable. Begin the fuel pressure test with the ignition and air conditioner both turned off. The fuel pressure gauge should already be connected from when you bled off the fuel system pressure. Shown here is the pressure gauge hookup on a 3800 Series 2 engine. Feed the bleed hose into an appropriate fuel container and turn the ignition back on. Use the Tech 2 to activate the fuel pump. The fuel pump activation is found on the Tech 2 under Special Functions and Engine Output Controls. Next, open and close the bleeder valve to bleed all the air out of the system. Removing air from the system will give you accurate gauge readings. Once the air is gone, energize the pump while viewing the fuel pressure gauge. The fuel pump will run for about two seconds and build pressure. Once the pump shuts off, the gauge should settle within specifications. If it doesn't, wait 10 seconds and then re-energize the pump. Cycle the pump as needed to achieve the highest reading. If the gauge repeatedly reads zero, then check the pump's electrical circuit. If the fuel pressure test falls within specifications, the system is off to a good start. But there are a few more checks needed before we can give the fuel delivery system a clean bill of health. There's one quick test that will check the performance of the fuel pressure regulator. Start the engine. And again, look at the pressure gauge. With the engine running at normal operating temperature, the fuel pressure should hover anywhere between 3 and 10 PSI lower than the reading taken with the engine not running. If it does, the system is performing well. If the gauge doesn't drop between 3 and 10 PSI, use a vacuum gauge to manipulate the fuel pressure regulator yourself. Apply between 12 to 14 inches of vacuum. If the gauge now drops within the specification, it means that somewhere there's a vacuum leak that's been preventing the vacuum-operated pressure regulator from doing its job. If applying your own vacuum still doesn't affect the fuel pressure, it means the pressure regulator is not working and needs to be replaced. Some fuel pressure problems only occur when the car is moving. Is your drivability problem only evident during acceleration, cruise, or hard cornering? If it is, road test the car with the scan tool connected. If the problem reoccurs and the number one oxygen sensor stops toggling, or in extreme cases drops below 500 millivolts, then what you're seeing is a momentary lean condition that could still be caused by a fuel pressure problem, even if the system passed the initial pressure test. The first two items to check are the in-pipe fuel filter and the fuel feed pipe. Check both for restrictions. If they're restricted, they may cause intermittent fuel pressure problems. If they're both okay, then turn your attention to the fuel sender assembly. Specifically, you'll need to check the fuel pump strainer for restrictions and correct positioning. Also, check the fuel pump pulse damper for leaks. If everything checks okay, but the intermittent lean condition persists while driving, then go ahead and replace the fuel pump. If the fuel pressure gauge shows the correct readings when the pump is running, but loses pressure once the pump shuts off, it means that there's a leak in one or more of five places. Possibilities include the fuel pump check valve, the fuel pump pulse damper, the fuel pump itself, the fuel pressure regulator, and one or more of the fuel injectors. Here's how to isolate the leak.